So we're going to start out the second half of our program today, and we're going to talk about Willamette Locomotive Number 4. Willamette Locomotive Number 4 is here in Port Angeles and is in the process of being restored. And it's a very cool project, and I'm really, it's, it's exciting to not only have the history of the locomotive, but also to have an opportunity to discuss about what we can do as individuals to help with that project and, and to get some visibility in terms of what the project is to restore the four. So we're going to have two guests in this presentation. First, I already, I already plugged him once, so I don't need to plug him a second time. Steve Hoff, our resident expert, is going to talk about the history of Willamette Number 4. And then Scott Golding from Fernandina Beach, Florida, folks, from one end of the continent to the other, will be here to talk about what we can do as individuals to help restore the four. So I'm going to pass the microphone over to Steve Hoff, and uh, here we go with Act 2. Uh, good afternoon, and, and thanks for coming back. Normally when I speak in the morning, nobody comes back in the afternoon. You know, they've had enough of this clown. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of, of number four. Scott knows what's going on uh, presently, and, and I'll talk about all of the years up to this point. Let's talk a little bit about why we call it a Willamette. Um, Willamette Iron and Steel, uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, built a total of 33 geared locomotives from 1922 to 1929. Uh, Willamette was, a, was the 800 pound gorilla, if you will, of, of logging machinery during that time period. Uh, they, they got their start about the turn of the century and gradually built up uh, a tremendous plant uh, down there and, and could build absolutely anything uh, for, for logging. They built electric skidders and they built steam uh, donkeys and they built boilers for, for various types of, of steamships and, and such. And, and uh, so in the, in the late teens, early 20s, loggers kept coming into the office down there and, and talked to a fellow by the name of Tony Labby, who was the vice president at that point. And, and was, uh, they convinced him that it would be a really good idea to build steam locomotives uh, for the logging industry that specifically targeted the Pacific Northwest logging industry. Uh, this was the, the Willamette uh, geared locomotive. And it looks a lot like the Shea geared locomotive, which was built in Lima, Ohio by the Lima Locomotive Works. Uh, from the patent of Ephraim Shea in 1881. Of course, by the turn of the century, the patents had all expired on the original Shea locomotive, and so they could uh, uh, build a, a virtual copy with, with a few tweaks to it to make it more uh, usable to the Pacific Northwest logger. And, and basically, it, it, what it amounted to was three cylinders on, on the side and, and then a gear uh, system down the, the right-hand side of the locomotive to, to power the individual wheels. Uh, the Willamette was a little bit different than the Shea in that they, they turned the valve chest to the outside uh, to make maintenance easier. And they also used a slightly different type of valve gear uh, on the locomotive that stayed in time a little bit better than, than that used on the, on the Shea gear locomotive. Now, here's the number four uh, this is this again. It's for the hardcore rivet counting uh, train nuts in in the audience. Uh, she was uh, construction number 16, and that puts it about midway through the 33 locomotives that they built. Uh, about two years after they started building locomotives, they turned out the the uh, number four in in August uh, of 1924. Uh, it was classified as what they called a 70-3 locomotive. The 70 reversed to the nominal tonnage of the locomotive, and the three just says that it was a three-truck locomotive or three wheel sets under, underneath the uh, uh, boiler and tank. Uh, it, was, it was a superheated locomotive, and superheating uh, is, is a way of making the steam more, more efficient. Uh, the, the steam pressure was nominally 200 pounds. Uh, as you're aware, steam boils, or water boils, and becomes steam uh, at 212 degrees at atmospheric pressure. 
If you put it in a boiler at 200 pounds of pressure, that steam is closer to 380, 390 degrees. And then if you take it and run it back through what they call a superheater, you can get it to even hotter and drier. And this makes the steam more efficient. And so this was a way of improving the efficiency of the locomotive. The oil tank behind the cab contained 1,500 gallons of, of uh, oil. And, and the water tank that's on the third truck was 4,000 gallons of, of water. It had a nominal working weight of 174,000 pounds, which tells you that, that uh, Willamette was lying about the 70 tons because she was actually on the tracks closer to 85 to 87 tons when, when it was in operating uh, order. Uh, this was the employment history of the, of the number four. It was part of a three locomotive order for Long Bell Lumber Company at Riderwood, Washington. Now, if you go down Interstate 5, when you get just north of Longview, you see the Riderwood Vader exit uh, from Interstate 5. And, and Riderwood was the Long Bell Company town. And it was built by Long Bell. It was owned by Long Bell. And there were nothing but Long Bell employees in, in the town. Uh, just outside of Riderwood was Vader, which was kind of a normal town. And, and in almost any company town uh, situation, the, you'll find a, a company town associated with a, an outside town. And that's because all of the bars and brothels were outside of the company town. And, and were then visited by the folks who lived actually in, in Riderwood. Uh, in 1947, Long Bell no longer had any particular use for, for Woods engines. They were consolidating their operations down there and sold the number four to Rainier uh, when she moved up to the North Olympic Peninsula. I, I show this as CQ Washington. The headquarters at that point were actually in Sappho, uh, but the, the rail uh, facilities were primarily centered in, in CQ. Uh, the city of Port Angeles was the recipient of a gift from Rainier in 1959 uh, when, when uh, they donated the locomotive to the city of Port Angeles to show Rainier's obligation or uh, uh, importance to the, to the town. Uh, here's a picture of, of then 701 of uh, Long Bell uh, down at, at Riderwood or near Riderwood in the, in the woods. Uh, here she is doing what we call bulk hook duties. Uh, she's on the construction crew and, and you can see the, the rail over here on the, on the flat car. Uh, this looks like the crew has just laid this track in up to what is obviously a spar tree. And uh, relatively soon they will bring in a, a unit or a skitter or a, or a, uh, 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 unit or a skitter or donkey to sit on this track and, and yard the logs into the loading area uh, where they would be loaded onto flat cars or, or log cars, uh, basically where the, the train is sitting. A few years later uh, in this show, she's uh, a little bit more worse for the wear. Uh, the 701 is shown in, in the uh, Riderwood engine facility and, and uh, still in, in reasonably decent condition, and, uh, but it's had a few changes over the years with the, the garbage can star, uh, spark arrestor and, and uh, there's a few dents and dings in the, the, the uh, cosmetic portions of the locomotive. The, the uh, long bell order was kind of interesting and, and you'll notice that uh, she has a, a cast steel end beam uh, the crews really didn't like this on, on the locomotives because most of the time that was oak and had a little bit of give to it so that when they banged into a, uh, a bunch of log cars, part of the shock was taken up in the end beam. Uh, in this particular case, that cast steel end beam uh, transmitted the entire shock to the, to the frame and the, and the crews then were more uh, uncomfortable. They actually had to learn how to couple the cars gently. Uh, so as not to wake up the firemen. When she came up to Rainier, uh, the vast majority of the, of the logging was now being, being off the, uh, 
being undertaken off of the Hoko main line, uh, which was west out of, out of CQ. Uh, toward the east, uh, things were beginning to taper down. And by the mid-1950s, they had taken up the, the line that ran up the Clallam River and over to, to Sappho. Uh, here, the number four on the right is, is shown with one of the mainline, or quote, mainline Mallies that they had on the operation, the uh, number eight. I would encourage all of you, if you're interested in, in learning about uh, this type of locomotive, there's a book out called Timber Titans. And, and my wife would be very happy if you would buy a lot of those because that would be more trips on Holland America for us. Uh, here she is uh, at Dickey Camp, which is farther up the, the uh, Hoko main line. And, and with sister to the eight, number nine, the eight and nine both were uh, Baldwin locomotives with, with uh, successive uh, builders' numbers that one went to the Saxon operation of Blodel Donovan, the other came out to to CQ, and then they were when uh, Blodel Donovan shut down the Alger and Saxon operations near Bellingham, uh, the the twins were reunited uh, on the CQ operations. Toward the end of her life at Rainier, the uh, the number four was was designated as the the dump engine. The Malleys would bring the logs out of the woods uh, down to CQ, and, and the number four would then dump the logs uh, at the log dump and build up the, the uh, empty train uh, to take back into the woods. Uh, this scene, if you're familiar at all with, with CQ, uh, the wastewater treatment plant is kind of uh, right there uh, between the, the water tanks here and, and the oil tanks down here. In the background, you can see the loads there that are awaiting the number four's attention, and, and she's kicking a, a bunch of empties that probably uh, she has just dumped uh, in, the, in the bay there. Here uh, is the number four. She's pushing a, a cut of logs out onto the, the uh, dump, the log dump. Uh, on the right-hand side here, you can see the, the office uh, this is kind of an interesting office because it was built uh, by Goodyear Lumber Company uh, probably in the mid-teens uh, and was used uh, until the close of the rail operations in the 1970s. Uh, went through Goodyear logging, then through Blodell Donovan Lumber Mills, and then on to, to Rainier, and, and uh, uh, a, very, a very sturdy structure for its age. In CQ, there was the engine shop, and that's where all of the major uh, maintenance was done on, on the locomotives. And, and the number four is sitting on the uh, engine yard, or the engine house uh, lead here. Behind the number four is, is the number 10. And the number 10 is what was called a Pacific Coast Shea. In 1927, Lima Locomotive uh, works decided that Willamette was taking too many sales from them in the Pacific Northwest. And so they built what was essentially a copy of the Willamette and, and turned it out and, and started competing with Willamette uh, in, in the Northwest uh, woods. Uh, it was very effective because there were very few Willamettes sold after the PC came out. Uh, it is interesting to note that that both of these locomotives are still in existence, the number four in Port Angeles and the number 10 uh, now in, in Forks. It was uh, originally built, the number 10 was originally built as a speculative engine, uh, went to the dealership in Seattle and sat there for many years before it was purchased by Ozette Timber Company. Uh, and then in 1954, Rainier took over Ozette uh, Timber Company and, and brought the number 10 into the fold. In 1959, it was determined that uh, the uh, number four would be donated to the city of Port Angeles. And, and of course, uh, the difficulty was how do you get a 70 or 80 ton locomotive uh, from, from the West End to Port Angeles? Well, it's really quite simple. You, you run it up to Salduck Reload, which is uh, just northwest of Forks, and then you load the main frame uh, like this on two logging trucks, one of which was backing the entire distance uh, from uh, Forks clear into Port Angeles. 
and and uh, it it worked very well. I think the the weight control officers from the Washington State Patrol may have been off that day, uh, so that nobody put some scales underneath these things because it you have a, a pretty fair chunk of of locomotive there, probably a, a almost fifty tons of, of locomotive on the uh, on the two trucks. Once in Port Angeles. Uh, it was uh, put back on its trucks and reconnected to the, the water tank uh, at a uh, park that was right at the corner of, of 101 or Lincoln Street and Lauritsen Boulevard. And that's just southwest of Jefferson School, for those of you who are locals. Uh, it stayed there for, for quite a few years until it was determined that that intersection needed to be rebuilt. Uh, when that occurred, they, the city of Port Angeles uh, simply moved the, the number four, and they did so by putting some temporary track down and then dragging the locomotive onto that temporary track and then picking it up, moving it around to the opposite end of the uh, locomotive, bolting it back together and dragging it another 60 or 70 feet down, down the line to the, the park where it, it currently resides. This is another picture of them uh, uh, crossing uh, the, the turn lane uh, down onto Lincoln Street. And, and uh, it took them uh, several, several days to do this. It was not a, a short process. Uh, once it was moved down to the, the two blocks or so to where it sits nowadays, the, a fence was erected around it. And, and unfortunately, uh, there was quite a bit of vegetation that grew up over the years. And, and while the, the uh, flowers and, and shrubs are, are very attractive to horticultural uh, folks, uh, for, for us uh, train types, you know, they're, they're obscuring a perfectly good Willamette geared locomotive. And so, uh, you know, if, if we were given chainsaws, we could solve the problem. Uh, and that is a very, very quick history of, of where uh, Rainier number four was over the, the past 50 or 60 years. Steve, thank you very much for that. And now I'm going to invite E. Scott Golding to come up. Scott, come on up. But, but I'm not gonna let you just talk by yourself for a second, because first I need to talk to you a little bit. So tell me a little bit about yourself and tell me why the Willamette number four is of interest to you. And tell me a little bit about your, your background here. Well, um, I have, uh, I guess, uh, oh, sorry. I have some uh, railroad in my blood. Um, my mom's family was uh, worked on the railroads in Iowa and the Midwest and um, as you're driving out of here today, uh, when you get to the corner of, or just before the corner of uh, Hendrickson and Priest Road, that big uh, tan uh, stucco house, uh, that's where I grew up. Um, and we used to spend, uh, every time the train would go by, uh, we actually knew the Barbary family uh, from Scouts. Uh, we could flash our dining room light and get a few extra whistles at the Priest Road crossing in our honor. So, um, uh, train nut from uh, birth, um, and I've, I guess I've just gotten into uh, the number four specifically uh, because, well, I've seen it my whole life and it was really hard to watch it turn into the rust bucket that it has become. So, um, I worked for Rainier. I moved to Florida when the Port Angeles mill shut down, but I, my family is still here. Uh, Mom's here on the front row with me. And uh, we, uh, you know, every time I come to town, I have to drive by number four. Uh, lately, I'm the Rainier historian, uh, as well as my day job. And uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, researching, uh, getting ready for our centennial, which is coming up in two years. Um, even though Rainier uh, doesn't have the mill anymore, we, we do, uh, still have uh, a lot of woods out in the uh, west end of Clallam County and uh, still grow trees and so on. The Restore the Four project was uh, many years in the making. A lot of people had been uh, approaching the city of Port Angeles for a long time about the 
sad shape that it was in. And uh, uh, I guess I just happened along at the right time. Um, the uh, uh, North Olympic Peninsula Railroaders, who have a table out, out in the uh, entryway, uh, and I uh, both approached the city at the right moment. Still being with Rainier, I guess that gave me some credibility or something. Uh, so uh, the and city parks director had time to uh, talk to us and and do his part of the the things that needed to happen to make this uh, project a, a possibility. So um, we uh, got together about two years ago and. Uh, formally signed an agreement uh, to, to make the project happen. Um, so the, uh, the official project partners are the city of Port Angeles, who owns the four, uh, the North Olympic Peninsula Railroaders, um, Rainier is a signer for funding, and I am an independent signer on the project because Rainier didn't want to be quite that far in bed with the project. So. Um, the locomotive has been sitting on display in Port Angeles for uh, more than 60 years. Uh, Rainier gave it to the city uh, as a monument. Uh, it arrived in Port Angeles in 1960 in uh, November, and uh, Rainier gave it to the city to be a monument to the local timber industry heritage. Uh, Self-interest aside, uh, Rainier's recognizing that uh, the timber industry has been a, a source of a lot of the, the growth that made uh, Port Angeles and Clallam County thrive and uh, wanted to uh, do something for the, the town that had uh, made, Port, made Rainier grow. So the, the last time that the uh, locomotive had had any real serious attention uh, was when the folks from uh, uh, Pacific Northwest Bell, the phone company, uh, came along in 1978, and they did a, a cleanup and repainting of it. Um, they uh, put an awful lot of work into it, as uh, you can imagine, uh, removed all the rest, uh, and did a full uh, paint job, and she looked pretty much like new at the end of it. Um, before that, Rainer had done the same thing before donating it. But, uh, you know, the, the years had gone by and sitting in the Port Angeles rain uh, had taken its toll. About 1985, the community began to ask questions about uh, asbestos. Uh, the locomotive has a nice 200-pound uh, uh, steam boiler uh, that's wrapped with asbestos insulation and then some sheet metal put on top to keep the insulation dry. As time passed and the... Uh, uh, the rust took over, the rain started getting in and uh, the insulation got wet. Rainwater as it rushes by carries some of the asbestos out and it was collecting on the running boards of the, the locomotive. Being right next to a school, uh, that was obviously a big deal. So the, the city uh, funded an emergency cleanup of the asbestos that was out and that was accessible, but they didn't have uh, funding to take the rest of the asbestos out. Um, but, you know, the community was asking questions about it by 1985. So, uh, you know, that, that was the beginning of the trend. Um, the, uh, the Port Angeles, or the, I guess it was the uh, Port Angeles Daily News at that point, um, had an article uh, talking about how Yes, there's asbestos, but it's totally safe. And uh, so turned out not to be true in the end. About uh, 2012, there was uh, a lot of the community uh, that was kind of upset about the uh, condition of the locomotive and the, the city started looking for options on where to put it. Um, a uh, study had been done, uh, community uh, consulted, et cetera, and it was almost relocated to, I don't know if you recognize the location, this is the end of the Port Angeles Plaza. Uh, I believe the building 113 here is Joshua's Restaurant, and uh, the 2104, I believe, is the Super 8 Motel. So, you know, it was uh, just about to be moved to 
the hillside there on that uh, uh, ravine as you come into Port Angeles. Um, probably a, a great spot for picture taking of whatever side uh, faced out, but it would have been really tough to get up close to it. And uh, so for myself, I'm glad it stayed where it is. Um, so in uh, 2022, uh, the city and Rainier and North Olympic Peninsula Railroaders and I got together, we formed a formal partnership to, uh, to make the restoration happen and uh, started the fundraising. The, the objectives for the project are to keep the, the locomotive here, first off. Uh, there were some uh, city council members in Port Angeles that uh, thought that the best idea would be to turn it into an artificial reef. Uh, that would have been a tragedy, I think. Um, but then to uh, fix it up and make it look good. And uh, not only do we want to restore it to the, uh, you know, so that it looks good, but also want to broaden it a little bit. The original goal in donating her to the city was to have a, uh, a monument to the local timber industry heritage. And we're going to try and make that happen as well. The, uh, not just to fix it up, but to, to make it the monument that it was originally supposed to be. Uh, we'll have a lot of signage and uh, storytelling of, of the, the timber industry and, and its contribution to the county. Um, we uh, also will make the park, uh, the, the, the park that sits in is a uh, traffic uh, triangle. Uh, it, it's not formally a park. Uh, there are no sidewalks. It's, if it's a rainy day, uh, there's, you know, you're going to walk through wet grass to get there. Um, we will be uh, building the park to have sidewalks so that you can get up close and personal. Uh, the landscaping will be kept to the side, as Steve points out. Uh, we don't want to obscure the view. But then we want this to, to be ready for the next 100 years. Um, as uh, you might have noticed in Steve's slides, the, uh, uh, her birthday is this August, August 3rd, and uh, that'll be her centennial. We're hoping that we can be largely done with the restoration by then. So uh, probably not necessarily with the, uh, the sidewalks and things, but uh, the, the restoration of the locomotive and putting a shelter over the top. Um, the first phase of the project is to clean up the asbestos. As I mentioned, there was an emergency cleanup done in 2019. Um, this has, this, um, did, uh, I mean, it, it's a pretty big undertaking to clean up asbestos, as you may know, um, cancer causing, et cetera, but it is complete. Uh, the city uh, funded the, the first phase, uh, and while she's not looking beautiful right now, I mean, that, that just exposed more rust. Uh, if you know what you're looking at, that is a major step forward. Um, now it is clean and we can uh, safely undertake whatever restoration work needs to be done. So uh, thanks to the city for funding it. Uh, they had allocated $50,000 for it. Uh, we were afraid that that number was way too low, that it was going to be more like 100000 But uh, they, they uh, went out to bid uh, $58,000 uh, and they covered it. So uh, thank you for, to, the, to them for that. Um, the next phase is to clean up the rust. Um, there is a lot of uh, holes that need to be cleaned up. Uh, the one, uh, you know, the, the paintwork is, is not a big deal. You can, we can uh, sandblast off the rust and, and repaint and uh, that's not that much to be done, but uh, there's a lot of things where there just isn't enough metal there to, uh, the metal flakes have quit holding hands as my dad would have said. and. Uh, uh, so we've, we've got a lot of metal work to be done as well. Um, but we'll, we'll get the rust off, we'll um, repair the holes, prime it and paint it, and we will be uh, replacing the windows and doors so that it's got uh, a nice weather-tight seal for the future. Uh, once that's done, um, the plans include a shelter over the top, and we've got some preliminary drawings here, uh, but uh, 
I understand that we will be designing it with, um, actually the, the uprights for the shelter will be out of uh, railroad rails. So uh, a fitting way to, to preserve a little bit more of that history. Um, the uh, uh, Steve Zenovic, uh, if you know him uh, from Port Angeles, is uh, working on the designs right now. So this can happen pretty soon. Um, but uh, you know, well underway. Uh, we are also working on the spec specification document for the repairs so that we can uh, get the uh, a project to do the repairs out to bid. Um, that because of its uh, all the lead-based paint that's on the locomotive, it's going to have to be tented and done by professionals. So, unfortunately, that'll be expensive. But uh, that's what we're fundraising for. Uh, phase three, as and this is part of the the recognition of the logging heritage, is that we're uh, we've generally acquired rights to. We we haven't made the paperwork happen, but we have a log car. Uh, made available to us by the uh, Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad. Uh, and so we will uh, be putting a log car behind it. We'll be talking to uh, timber companies to get a sort of period correct uh, load of logs donated for uh, putting on the log car. And by period correct, I mean not the, the little things that we grow today, but you know, some, some big trees. Um, I don't know if we can get them quite that big, but uh, we are uh, aiming for something bigger than the, the little ones that, that we grow today. Um, and phase four, this again is a preliminary site plan, but uh, this is the, the site. There's the existing locomotive and a uh, tender, and uh, we show two log cars, but it'll probably be just one. But uh, putting in sidewalks and uh, so on around the shelter and and uh, making sure that the landscaping keeps the, the locomotive front and center. We have a number of uh, partners that, that are helping out. Um, the county uh, has uh, started uh, the, the project out with the, the first donation, a, uh, a $2,500 grant from the uh, county historical, help me with the name. Yes, the County Heritage Advisory Board, that's, that's right. Um, and I got it wrong on my slide, I'm sorry. Um, the city obviously paid the, the uh, asbestos part of it. Rainier has uh, made uh, $8,500 in donations and pledges. Uh, the North, Northwestern Rotary Club of Port Angeles um, recently announced a $10,000 and uh, then uh, a lot of individuals have, have also made personal donations. Um, and Judy's gonna join me for a second with our thermometer. Hi, I'm Judy Riendo Stite from the Square Museum. And I've been involved with this train for about 65, 70, maybe 80, 80 years. But we took on the NOPR when they were looking for a home, and that's the little model railroaders, and they're amazing, amazing men. And one of the gentlemen, Gary Vahinen, wrote the grant and went to the County Advisory Heritage Board, and they granted it. This is the reason the state gives one or mandates one dollar out of every five dollar filing fee to protect things and restore and this that's how the whole grant is written so they've applied for more and we're up i don't know how accurate this is today because we recently cut a check and went over to the city and and of course uh the rotary has given the most amazing donation so the Squim Museum's been involved with this for about two and a half years, and we're all train maggots around here. I mean, we love the train. We want, we want everybody to love the trains. So throw some money in the bucket when you go by. And thank you very much, Scott, for taking your own personal time, and Steve Zenovic and all the people involved. Thank you. Thank you. We have a project website, if you're interested. Um, it's www.restorethefour.org. And um, there are opportunities to donate. Uh, there are uh, 
items that you can buy. Sitting in the back is uh, Mike, if you see him back there. Uh, we have uh, t-shirts and hats and thumb drives. Uh, the thumb drive actually includes the video of the number four in action. Uh, and so uh, it's about a two and a half hour uh, collection of videos. Uh, if you're into trains, uh, I think you'll find it's a, a great addition to your collection. Um, but how can you help? First off, spread the word. Um, as we are trying to fund the project, and we are at uh, 34700 and something dollars today, um, as we write grants, the, the grant organizations all try to gauge how much the community is behind the project. So um, the, the very best thing that you can do, um, well, besides writing a check, uh, is to lend us your name. Um, if you go to the website, or uh, Mike has brochures back there, uh, there's a section you can fill out your name and uh, drop it off with us. We will add you to the list of uh, project supporters. And the more supporters we have, the more people that are willing to lend their name, the better chance we have with, with grants. Um, as I mentioned, we've got uh, merchandise. There are t-shirts and hats and, and the video in the back. Um, we also have uh, been given access uh, eBay uh, when if you have stuff in your house and you want to sell it, sell it on eBay. Uh, eBay will uh, take 100% of the donations. They will waive all of their fees, et cetera. And uh, the, you just designate uh, North Olympic Peninsula Railroaders as the charity that you want to donate to. And uh, it all happens behind the scenes. Um, so that, that's a great way to help as well. We're hoping that there will be some uh, volunteer opportunities uh, to work actually on the, uh, the restoration work this summer. And uh, so if you're interested uh, in those opportunities, uh, sign up or send us an email. Um, the brochure that Mike and um, the uh, library, or the, I'm sorry, the um, arts and, thank you. Square Museum and Arts Center uh, tables each have the brochures if, if, with our contact information if you want to uh, offer to help or whatever. If you didn't bring your checkbook or whatever today, the uh, merchandise is also available on eBay as well. Um, I wanted to take a second. Everybody that is here from NOPR, uh, just raise your hand. I know there's, there's some out in the lobby as well. OK. Um, Yes. Judy says, if you miss the meeting, you become president. Uh, that is how she became the president. Um, anyway, I wanted to say thank you to everybody who has given and, and helped otherwise. Yes, sir. Uh, is there going to be a fence around this? Uh... It, it will be more or less like the fence that's there now, hoping for uh, you know a little less rust on it, too. But uh, yeah. No, unfortunately. Um, the, the good thing, you know, the, the number four was open for people to climb into for many years, uh, particularly at its first location. And there's lots of stories of people that come up and talk about having, you know, as a child climbed up in it and uh, enjoyed it. Unfortunately, that's, that's not the plan. Um, but the upside of that is um, if you go out to the locomotive and forks, if you happen to look up into the cab, all of the dials and switches and levers and knobs are gone. Number four, they're all still here. So it, it is better preserved the way it is, unfortunately. There's, there's our, um, our information as well, um, www.restorethefour.org. Uh, fix the four at uh, yahoo.com. Unfortunately, restore the four was already taken somehow. Uh, my personal email, esgolding at gmail.com. And you can reach out as well to the City of Port Angeles Parks and Rec Department. Uh, Corey and any of the, the rest of the team are happy to answer questions as well. Don't run away. I got a couple questions for you. So, so how many people have been working on this project so far? And, and what's, what, what level of inclusion do you have? Well, I'm sure I'm not the one that knows all of the people. Uh, that, that's the downside of living in Florida is I, I am not as in touch with what happens locally. But um, there are 
probably 40 or 50 people that have contributed uh, time and energy so far locally. Great. And, and what sort of a timeline are we looking at to be able to see the, the restored four in, in actual, in a restorated state? That is a great question. We are really hoping that we can have it done this summer. Um, the, um, the August 3rd anniversary is coincidentally my wife's and my anniversary as well. So I don't know who has first claim, but we're really hoping that we can have, uh, yeah, <laughs> true. So we're, we're really hoping that we can have it largely done uh, by that August 3rd uh, date. The dollar uh, for every time you put your name under the donation and the guy is pay up to 700. Unfortunately, that uh, ran through the end of the year and he did not choose to renew. So we, we, we had a grant going, uh, an anonymous donor had, um, you know, understanding that we need to get people to lend their name to the project. We had one donor who was willing to, if you go to the website, there's a guest book that you can sign, and he was going to donate a dollar for every person that signed the guest book. But uh, unfortunately, that was through the end of the year. So thank you. Thank you, Scott. And, and, and thank you, Steve. A very nice presentation on a very important piece of history. So this is just great. We're gonna take a short break and then we're going to have our Seattle and North Coast employees reunion. So come on back for the final act of today's program. So thanks very much and we'll see you in about five minutes. <laughs>